This is KGUA in Wallala 88.3 FM. This week on Peggy's Place, we are simulcasting the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium. That's up next, right after a word from our sponsor. One of the greatest threats to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. Well, Judy and Frank Mello of Point Arena are doing their part with the B. Bryan Preserve, which is actively committed to the breeding and preservation of endangered African hoofstock. Their daily one-hour tour around this 110-acre preserve gives you a close-up look of various endangered zebra, giraffe, and antelope as they roam about. You get to feed the giraffe and just might get a kiss from one of the giraffe boys. Want to stay among the animals? Then book one of B. Bryan's quaint cottages. B. Bryan Preserve in Point Arena, California and online at bbryanpreserve.com. To book your tour or stay, call 707-882-2297 today. Welcome to Peggy's Place. I'm Leanne Lindsay, your host for our special simulcast event this week of October 26, the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium, brought to you by Mindanoma Whale and Seal Studies Scott and Tree Mercer and KGUA Public Radio on the Pacific Ocean in Wallala, California. For the next few days, you'll discover the status of our oceans and the life forms that inhabit them, presented by a variety of ocean experts, including the Ocean Foundation's Richard Charter, Ocean Conservation Research's Michael Stalker, University of New Hampshire's Carter Mercer, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy's Marianne Long, Redlands University's Tessa Foster, Noyo Center for Marine Sciences, Sarah Grimes, Blue Planet Solutions, Zach Cliver, and today's three guests, BioWave's Jeff Jacobson, Orca Network's Howard Garrett, and Aquatic Research Conservancy's London Fletcher. The topics include how climate change is, is affecting our oceans, killer whale cultural biology, the leopard seal population outside the Antarctic, the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale, acoustical adaptations to the ocean's dark and wet environment, and the pursuit of ropeless fishing for lobster and crab which helps protect all marine life from being caught up in fishing lines. You can watch this Ocean Life Symposium live on KGUA's YouTube TV channel, which we will share on Facebook pages of both KGUA and the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study. You can listen at 88.3 FM locally and online worldwide at kgua.org. Just click listen live and save the KGUA Air Pocket app to your smartphone, tablet, or computer. We are also on apps Radio Garden and Tune In. Our first guest is Jeff Jacobson of BioWaves, who will give us a rapid review about killer whale cultural biology. Jeff is a senior marine biologist of BioWaves who has a wide range of experience and professional skills in studying the ocean and marine life. He collaborates on a diverse set of projects from stem cell research to contaminants. His professional skills include passive acoustic monitoring, which includes both analog and digital underwater acoustic recording recording of marine mammal vocalizations. Since 1977, he has been a cetacean research biologist in locations throughout the North Pacific and has a long time familiarity with the inside passage from the Southeast Alaska to Puget Sound and the coastal waters of Northern California and Oregon. He does photographic identification of whales and dolphins and since 1994. He has been a field biologist doing surveys of seabirds and their behavior. He continues a variety of long-term survey efforts of Northern California killer whales, humpback whales, gray whales, blue whales, seabirds, and albacore. Please welcome Jeff Jacobson to the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium. Is that working? That's perfect, Jeff. Oh, good. Okay. Well, hang on, folks. This is going to be fast. I'm going to try to cram in a quick review of what has been learned in the last 50 years since killer whales were first started being studied in the wild, all leading up to an aspect of culture and evolution 
that is quite similar to us in so many ways, yet incredibly different. Okay, well, first off, killer whales are the largest dolphin. I'm gonna use orca and killer whale interchangeably here. They're the largest dolphin and dramatically the males are very much larger than the females. We call sexual dimorphism, which I like to represent here in the size of their pectoral fins, their hidden hands and arms uh, that uh, are, 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 these are both adult animals, adult male and adult female. So starting around 1965, wild killer whales are being captured around Vancouver Island and put into tanks for public display, taught to do tricks, etc. Then the question started to arise, well, how many killer whales are out there? Is this harvest sustainable? Well, what needed to be known, figured out was the population size, how many were out there, what the birth and death rates were, the home range of these animals, how far did they travel, and what was the social structure in amongst these uh, highly developed dolphins? And what were they eating? What was their diet? But how do you go figure that out in wild animals, let alone a killer whale that you're only gonna see at the surface briefly? Well, Mike Big started to uh, look into this in 1970 and he eventually uh, figured out that um, and developed individual photographic identification two years later. Ken Balcom joined in soon therein and still at it along with many, many, many others in this era and now around the world. Well, photographic identification, all animals do not look alike. So if you document their natural markings, you've essentially tagged that individual whale without sticking anything in them. And you can now follow their life histories. Turns out that there were far fewer killer whales than expected and the exact number out was known out there. Again, it wasn't a whole lot of them. It was the same ones over and over again. Individuals are always found traveling in their same groups, their family groups called pods. Turned out that they were long lived, slow to reproduce and slow to die. And it was decided that the harvest was not sustainable and captures in this area ended in 1981. So here's a page out of the photo ID catalog. You can download these things now. You can buy them in bookstores. You can identify the animals swimming off your shores uh, using these guides. Um, briefly, each pod was given a letter and then each individual in the pod was given a number. This page alone is probably worth a half an hour of explanation description. You've got the sex of the individual, their birth date, whether it's known exactly, if they were born during the study or estimated, and the lineage. You got grandma here in the top, her two sons, her two daughters, her daughter's kids on the bottom. Early on, it was observed that these whales that were frequently seen in the inside passage had it divided into two fairly distinct ranges, uh, the Northern community, Northern Vancouver Island, all the way up to Prince Rupert, and the Southern community, just three pods in the Puget Sound Salish Sea area. So what was a resident pod? Well, they were observed almost daily when the salmon mi were migrating through the inside passage. They were observed to only hunt salmon and it seemed like they prefer Chinook salmon over the other uh, salmon species that were migrating. They're fussy eaters. And the pods, well, they're a matriline, a female and her daughters, and then eventually her granddaughters as we saw on the page. And this includes the sons and the grandsons, a very unique thing among social mammals that there's no dispersal by males from a resident pod natal group. The boys stay with mom until death do them part. When pods get large, when her, her daughters have lots of kids, they eventually divide along match lines, especially when food isn't so concentrated, but they all get together now and then and interact. So life history became known of, of these whales. We knew their exact ages or they could be estimated. Turns out females live around up to 50 years or so um, on average, 45, 50 years, but can survive up into their eighties. Males, a lot less, lived around 30 years of age, 
but can survive into their 50s. So their reproductive life history. Well, males start sprouting their dorsal fins at around 15 years of age when they become sexually mature. And they finish growing at about the age of 21 years. And it turns out from the genetics that's, that has been done that only a few males in the group sire most of the calves. This fits in with their sexual dimorphism in that it tends to correlate with polygyny, um, a yet another story for another time. Females, however, well, they have their first calf. Uh, they were observed with their first calves at about age to 12 to 14 years. And there seems to be a three, five, average five year interval between their calves. So again, a slow calving rate. However, we only knew the calves that had survived long enough to be photographed for the first time. And it turns out that, that there is a rather high neonate mortality rate within the first six months of life, many of them die. Not sure why. Reproductive life for females ends at around 40 to 45 years. They stop having calves, but continue living. Well, hang on, let's do some maths. Females can live up to 80 years old, but they stop reproducing at 40 to 45 years. This begs the question, what do human and female, <laughs> what do human and killer whale females have most in common? Not a trick question, it's obvious, menopause. AKA a post-reproductive life. Resident killer whales have become the best studied population for this among animals. Um, and in killer whales, post-reproductive -re life lasts around 15 to 30 years. That's a long time. It's post-reproductive life is only observed in humans killer whales, and three other species of toothed whales, the pilot, the beluga, and the narval. So how do these non-productive females contribute to their, their pods? Uh, surely they have to have a role because there is a cost to maintaining the group. Well, food provisioning of close kin has been observed, especially to the young calves. So they are actively catching fish and giving the fish to their calves which by investing in their calves, they're increasing their inclusive fitness, their survival of their offspring's offspring, and also will reduce the interbirth interval of their daughters. All this has been um, established and documented. Um, being the oldest in the group, they have a lot of knowledge, long lived, large brained. And it turns out in one study in the Salish Sea area, that when scammon were, became scarce, the grandmas were more often leading the pod as they were traveling to find food. Well, their sons, they reproduce till they die, but only a few of them get most of the uh, matings. So maybe mom helps them get a date? Who knows? Further research required. And you know they're intensely social, long-lived, large-brained, it gets complicated, another story. So let's dip a hydrophone in the water and listen for a bit. Killer whales have a very highly developed auditory con cortex in their very large brain. They produce whistles, which are tonal, variable, and usually used for close range uh, communication. For, for further long range communication, uh, they produce echolocation clicks which are repeated slowly because it takes that click time to get out, reflect off the object they're interested in and get back to them. However, pulse calls are taking those echolocation link clicks and repeating them at an incredibly high rate such that the frequency you're hearing is due more to that repetition rate than the frequency of the click. These calls become very complex have very wide band harmonics, which you'll see soon in, in the sonograms. These calls are very stereotypic. They are individually distinct. They are learned and they are amazingly stable. Killer whales that were put in captivity decades ago are still making the same calls that their families are making out in the wild. 
And these calls vary with behavioral context, the level of arousal of the individuals. So it turns out that residents feeding on salmon are very vocal when they're foraging because salmon can't hear them. They have a whole different other hearing system. So John Ford spent years recording uh, all the resonant pods in the area. And he discovered four distinct dialects among these um, pods. And, and that there was no call sharing among acoustic clans. This is extraordinary because just from surface observations in the photo ID, all these pods are all interacting with one another. You would never ever suspect that there was such a discrete division in their vocal repertoire. Yet here it is. Notice that in the uh, A clan up here, in the Northern community, you're having three clans. Um, the A clan has all these this call sharing amongst in individual pods within the A clan. Same with the G clan and the R clan, the acoustic clans. And there's no lines connecting these groups. There's no call sharing. And then in Southern Vancouver Island, the Southern resident community has just another set of vocalizations. Again, no call sharing. So when Akela was making a call, in a way he's, he's sending out five messages. The clan or pod identity, probably individual identity because they all hear each other their whole lives. They would know where they are, what they're doing, their activity level, and by context that we'll probably never ever really know, unless we become killer whales, many other messages are possible. So let's try this out. Here's an example of um, some two calls from the A clan. And whoops, sorry. That work? It sure did. Oh, good. One more time. <laughs> so you can kind of follow along and sing along if you want. The, it's a sonogram. The time is on the lower axis. Frequencies in the upper axis. It's going to vary between different sonograms here. Um, and see if you can follow along with this. Two minutes? Oh, my God. You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I do get wrapped up in these things. Okay. So you can see from all these sonograms that there's a lot of uh, variability amongst the calls. Then one day, a whole bunch of different killer whale groups come in. They're transients. They just transit through the area to eat marine mammals. They sound different. They don't interact with residents, mutual avoidance. And they have very different calls. And then there's a third group that comes into the area, the offshore killer whales. Um, they travel much greater distances. They apparently eat sharks and rays and fish. Um, they look very different and um, they don't interact with the residents of transients. What's going on? So it turns out there's three different ecotypes in the North Pacific. An ecotype isn't a different species. It's a different race or um, type. As we've observed, they all have different morphologies. It turns out they're very genetically distinct. And here they are around the whole world, 10 different ecotypes around the world. And maybe there's an 11th ecotype now that's just been observed down off of the Mexican coast. The global genetics of killer whales has been now established. And we now have um, many, many different ecotypes. Um, that have formed in the last, say, 250,000 years. The killer whales have been in their fossil record for 5 million years. What's going on? Well, culture, in a word. I refer you to this, um, uh, this book here by Hal Whitehead. And it goes on and on into how genes and culture co-evolve with one another. And which is a fascinating topic now in, in, in animals as well as in humans. And so these resident killer whales are like a treasure, the best studied whale society in the world. Um, detailed information over the last 50 years has been accumulated for a long time. And we've only just begun to study um, most of the other ecotypes. 
and I hope this sets a context for, for Howard and how special these animals are and how much we know about them even more than um, other, any whales that could be learned, what we can ever learn from whales in captivity. So thank you once again. And uh, sure it'd be fun to have questions, but we'll get to that somehow. Thanks, Jeff. You can tell his obvious enthusiasm for that enlightening quick review about killer whale cultural biology. That was Jeff Jacobson of BioWaves, Inc. This is the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium brought to you by the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study and KGUA Public Media in Wallala, 88.3 FM. We are simulcasting on YouTube and sharing the link to our Facebook and Instagram pages. Listen in worldwide at kgua.org through our KGUA Air Pocket app and on apps Radio Garden and TuneIn. This is Peggy's Place. I'm your host, Leanne Lindsay. And our next speaker is Orca Network's Howard Garrett, who will talk to us about uh, two new J-Pod calves, the celebrations, implications, and observations. He began working as a field researcher with the Center for Whale Research on San Juan Island in 1981. The Orca Network is dedicated to raising awareness of the whales of the Pacific Northwest and the importance of providing them healthy and safe habitats. Howard gives presentations on Orca natural history, conservation, and captivity issues in Washington and beyond. And his focus is on the southern resident orcas of the Salish Sea and coastal waters now down to only 73 members. Their diet has been primarily Chinook salmon for millennia. Now he's going to give us an insight on why Chinook are so crucial at, to their survival and what we can do to help them. Please welcome Howard Garrett to the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium. Well, Jeff, wow, did you ever set the context? I mean, you gave the entire background. I'm so glad this is recorded. Um, everyone, please keep in mind every word Jeff said when you hear what I say about some uh, recent calves that have just been born. So I will uh, go ahead and proceed into screen sharing. Um, and, oh yes, and share. Have your presentation ready. There you go. Right. And um, let's see, I need to maximize that, don't I? Yeah, but from the There back. we go. Yep. How's that? Can you see the map? Yes, we can. Thank you so much, Howard. Great. Uh, so um, I am going to tell you about mainly the events of September 5th and the superpod, the birth of the baby and the superpod of September 5th, because I think what happened there that day was legendary. It was really amazing and it should go down in history. Uh, this map shows basically where it all took place. The day before, on September 4th, J-Pod was in Georgia Strait, up in the North area in Canada, where they had been for five days. K and L pods were somewhere out at sea, somewhere probably on Swiftster Bank, uh, out, uh, you can see out on the western edge of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, which is a very productive area where southern residents and northern residents and transients and even offshores often forage, but they never interact. Remember what Jeff said, they don't interact. They have completely different language systems and cultures. So on the morning of September 5th, J-Pod was seen from San Juan Island spread out foraging all the way down to Hind Bank. At about 11 a.m., K's and L's were reported coming in from the Pacific for the first time since July. About that time, J-Pod started trending southwest toward the K's and L's. That afternoon, anticipating a superpod, the Center for Whale Research launched three boats, one from Victoria and two from San Juan Island. Around 3.30, a whale watch naturalist noticed a blip next to J-35, Tahlequah. 
when there's a newborn orca, a blip is all you see. The mother comes up in this smooth, graceful arc and this powerful blow. And then you see right next to the mom, a little blip, and that's the baby. So that was seen um, about 3.30 in the afternoon. So the Center for Whale Research confirmed that a new calf had been born to J35 and assigned its alphanumeric as J57. Its dorsal fin was upright, so it had probably been born about 12 to 24 hours earlier. And J35 had been seen two days earlier without the calf. About 3 p.m., K&L pods started coming in at speed. They were clocked at 15 knots for a while. And these photos, by the way, are from the uh, Center for Whale Research uh, website, whaleresearch.com encounters. And I recommend everyone go there for a complete write-up of the encounters and the most amazing orca photos that you'll ever see anywhere. And it goes back many years, hundreds of encounters are in detail there. Um, and they were starting to move in really fast into where J-Pod was south of San Juan Island. And this is what it was about. J-57 sees his first day in the world. Um, and all 23 members of J-Pod were at that 23 members were uh, headed west, right toward K's and L pod, K's and, and uh, L's that were coming in south of Victoria. And they met in the middle in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And here, J35 and newborn J57 are with big brother J47, Notch. For the rest of the day and into the night, they frolicked, they, they breached, they mixed and mingled, they spy hopped, they rolled around on each other, no doubt making babies. They spread out over several miles and they weren't foraging for food that entire time. They were there at a party. They were having some kind of celebration. And if you do go to the Center for Whale Research website and look for that encounter, you'll find a video that shows by far better the kind of socialization that was going on, the socializing, the, the mixing and mingling, the super potting that, as it's called, um, it was really fantastic. And there was also a blog there by Lodi Budwill, who was out in the boat with Ken, Ken Balcom at the time to uh, document the whales. And she wrote a very inspired blog about some amazing events that took place that day. And word spread immediately. Within an hour, it was in the Seattle Times. The next morning, it was in the New York Times. Um, everybody was extremely excited, including the whales. You could tell by their behavior. They weren't their usual busy foraging selves. They weren't uh, just, you know, spread out and looking for fish in every nook and cranny they could find. They were playing. They were socializing. They were glad to see each other. They were having a very good time. And this birth was especially meaningful because in 2018, that same mom, J35, Talikwa, had carried her deceased newborn on her rostrum on her, on her head basically for 17 days of sadness. that has been called a tour of grief. It brought the attention of the world to the fact that these orcas are in trouble. They're, they're hurting, they're, they're not getting enough to eat, they're suffering reproductive failures. So it was encouraging to see that she was now able to bring a healthy new calf into the world. And of course, the whales remember two years ago, too. They were there. They experienced it in whatever way orcas would experience something like that. And so 
they were celebrating. Maybe they were encouraged and, and just so happy to see that J35 was able to bring a healthy newborn into the world. They sure looked like they were celebrating anyway. They were all bunched up and touchy feely group into touchy feely groups and that mostly included members of all three pods. So they were they were mixing and greeting and, and sort of reconfirming those relationships. On September 22nd, J35's new calf, J57, was ID'd as a male from this photo. And uh, you can just barely see the belly markings. Uh, that made news throughout the region as well. Uh, but males are, are not our first choice because boys don't have babies and we need a lot of new babies. So, um, you know, it's good to know, but we'd like to see more females. Of the 43 calves that have been born into the Southern residence since 1998, 27 are males and 15 are females. So there's a real strong bias toward having males for some reason. It's not really understood, but it doesn't help the population grow that much. And then on September 24th, J41 Eclipse gave birth to her calf, her new calf, J58. And this time the dorsal fin was flopped over when they were first seen, which means that that calf had been born just moments, minutes before it was seen. It was first seen by a whale watch naturalist and then confirmed again by the Center for Whale Research. And happy to report that they were seen again, October 17th. That baby seems to be doing just fine. Isn't that the cutest little baby orca you ever did see? Uh, so all of that is very good news. And to sort of add to what Jeff was saying about natural history, uh, their pregnancy lasts about 18 months. That's a long time, twice as long as humans, of course. Orca babies are about eight feet long when they're born and weigh about 400 pounds. And their brains are already three times the size of our adult human brains. So they've been listening to orca chatter. Their, their auditory senses are, of course, very well developed. They're, their primary sense, their, their way of getting around in the world is by sound, by sending echolocation and hearing it. So they've been hearing their chatter, orca chatter of their family for probably about a year already. So they've learned the language before they're even born and before they can even make a sound. So the question often comes up, who's the daddy? Well, we don't know until the genetic work is done uh, from the fecal studies, but from those studies previously, uh, L41 has been one of the prolific uh, daddies, you could say. And as Jeff mentioned, only a few of the males are the, uh, the major uh, sources, the major fathers of pretty much all of them. And since J1 died, L41 has been the major source of most of the babies. So he could very well have been the daddy of those two babies and many more. Sadly, he left us in late 2019. Um, so he's, he's no longer there and we don't know which males will be doing the daddies now. This photo shows him and L85, another adult male, babysitting a day-old calf, L124, who could have been another of his progeny back in January 2019. Two new calves were born in early 2019, one in L-pod and one in J-pod, and both are still doing very well, as far as we know. So that's a very good sign. Uh, two calves from 2019, two from, from this year, uh, 
but those were the first calves that have been born and survived since 2015. So why so many successful births lately um, after such a long lack of any new babies? Well, here's a, an illustration that gives a sense of uh, what is a La Nina event, which is cooler water. And that surface water in the Gulf of Alaska, the whole Northeast Pacific, uh, is very good for salmon. A lot more salmon can live in, in cooler water. So maybe there was just enough food. They seem to have had enough food in the last uh, two years or so to be able to, to uh, do quite well. Um, it's impossible to say really why there are more calves now than there have been before. Uh, there are so many different variables. It's all really speculation, but that La Nina is, is probably a part of the reason that there are at least sufficient salmon. But overall, salmon populations along the East Pacific are in bad shape. They have been in decline for 100, 150 years. And that, because the Southern residents focus so almost exclusively on Chinook salmon, the biggest, the, the highest calorie content of all the salmon. Um, and those are the salmon that are most especially in trouble. So uh, it's really no wonder. Uh, this map of the Salish Sea is perfect. Uh, this is the definitive map that got the the, uh, the Salish Sea named the Salish Sea. And for some reason that I really like, uh, it includes the Columbia River. Uh, and that is where most of those salmon come from. So I'm gonna kind of wrap it up here um, so that we can get on to the next speaker to London. Um, and uh, just want to say that we need to clear up the, uh, the rivers in the Columbia River. We need to remove those dams, basically. Um, I can go into a whole advocacy area here about how and why we need to remove the four dams on the Snake River uh, to open up 5,500 miles of prime salmon habitat. Uh, and uh, we'll do more about that. And by the way, your representative, Jared Huffman, probably wants to do that from indications I've seen, but, oh, it says Columba. Well, Columbia River is what that is. Um, but, you know, he needs to have the Washington delegation to uh, advocate that as well. Thank so, you for that very informative I'll leave you with that. update. Yes, thank you so much, Howard. And what beautiful photos of those two new J pod calves. Thank you so much. That's Howard Garrett of the Orca Network. This is the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium brought to you by the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study and KGUA Public Media in Walala 88.3 FM. We are simulcasting this symposium from Zoom to our YouTube TV channel and sharing the link to our Facebook and Instagram pages. We stream worldwide at kgua.org and on our KGUA Air Pocket app and on apps Radio Garden and Tune In. This is Peggy's Place. I'm your host, Leanne Lindsay, and our next speaker is a talented and composed young woman named London, who is going to talk about the first resident leopard seal population outside of the Antarctic. London Fletcher is a 13-year-old with a keen eye to the planet's future. She has become involved in a flagship environmental issue, the plight of the southern resident killer whales. For the past seven years, she has tirelessly advocated on behalf of the southern resident killer whales. She is a research assistant at the Orca Research Trust in New Zealand and the principal researcher at her own nonprofit, the Aquatic Research Conservancy. She is probably the youngest person 
ever to earn an internship in cytology, which she completed with Dr. Ingrid Visser at the Orca Research Trust in New Zealand during the summer of 2017. London is also the youngest member of the Society of Marine Mammalogy, as well as the youngest member of the American Acoustical Society. Please welcome to the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium, London Fletcher. So uh, I will be presenting on uh, leopard seals as has already been stated, and I'm just really honored to be here. So let me try to share this. Hmm. Is that, can you see my? We sure can, that's perfect. So uh, I've already been introduced, but I'd like to just start off with a little bit about how I got into this, uh, into researching leopard seals. So when I interned in New Zealand in 2017, uh, I began uh, working on this, on this project to document these leopard seals that were showing up. And so since then, I've been working on this and our, the paper on this got published in 2019, and we are still documenting the leopard seal population. But this, this presentation isn't about me. It is about leopard seals. So let's get into that. Uh, so leopard seals are widely distributed around the Southern Hemisphere, but they, uh, they're in the Antarctic and uh, the Antarctic sea ice. They also populate subantarctic islands, South America, South Africa, and Australia, and New Zealand, and all of the lowest latitudes. And in the beginning, the leopard seals were very curious. We, we saw only one, but she, was, she would always come up to boats and passerbys and poke her head out of the water, which was a very, it's almost a very frightening thing to see as interesting as it is because they are very, very big and have many teeth. But back then she would also just chill on beaches and you can see that they would close off beaches as to prevent civilians from getting harmed by her since this is a predator. She would also mainly haul out at marinas. And when we saw her, she was more often than not asleep. After being in the Auckland region for over a year, she was given a name. So this is her Maori name that I'm not going to pronounce fully because I know I'm going to butcher it. But for short, we call her Ofa and it translates to treasured gift from our ancestors. So the Maori population in New Zealand took her unusual presence as almost a spiritual thing. And a lot of times she obstructed access uh, in marinas, so she would block access from boats, which uh, led people to be very upset. So we were told that she doesn't belong here. But this, her unusual presence heralded a new era of research. So like any competent researchers, we went to Google, but a lot of the uh, records we saw, they were seasonal, they were immature, or they were in poor condition. And a lot of the times they were sporadic and just overall evidence of non-residency. And we didn't see any births from Google, but we had more questions. So is this just in Otago, New Zealand, or is it uh, in the entirety of New Zealand? So we searched many databases for tr trying to look for historical records of leopard seals. Uh, social media, museums, uh, all sorts of things. And we founded our, oh, ah. we founded our own organization to document this uh, called leopardseals.org. So leopardseals.org is not, is a for-profit organization that consists of scientists, volunteer, volunteers, and we conduct research and education and advocacy for the leopard seal population in New Zealand. So from museums, we found lots of very historical records, which was unexpected. And you can see them over the years. Some of them are a little more concerning than others, what the people were doing, close, because this is an apex predator and it is not that safe to be so close to them. But, and we found many uh, records, some of them more concerning than others, leopard seals looking slightly maimed, which is very concerning, but, which leads me to our next point, their occurrence in New Zealand. So across the world, uh, they are not that 
frequently seen outside the Antarctic. So we have a few records from all over the world. And this is, for some reason, it is not advancing. Hmm. So we see them in Australia, only seven records. And the New Zealand Leopard Seal Database, or the NZLSD for short, uh, for the records from 12,000 to 219 are 3,000 records. Uh, which the New Zealand Leopard Seal Database of Leopard Seal Sightings Worldwide is the largest one. And Leopard Seal Sightings have uh, increased greatly over the years. But so there is a specific, we need to see specific things from the population for them to be considered resident. So they cannot be immature or in poor condition or seasonal or sporadic. That is not evidence of residency. So they're immature. And so we can see that the majority of them were not adult. And poor condition, so their spine and ribs are showing in here and they look very emaciated. We do not want to see this. We don't see it often, but it is very concerning when we do. And in fair condition, only their ribs are showing. You can see that, uh, that a leopard seal in good condition should have a sort of nice torpedo shape about them. And in excellent condition, there should be a fat layer over the hips. Uh, and you shouldn't see any protruding bones. So we had many in good or excellent condition, but also these were slightly seasonal, but we did see them all year round with peaks in spring and winter. And they were slightly sporadic, but they were all over the entirety of New Zealand, which showed maybe they are resident which leads us to our next point. So in order for them to be considered resident, we need to start off with seeing how many individuals there are. And if the, we are seeing these individuals again, or if it's a one-time thing. And this led me to start the photo ID of leopard seals. So unlike orca, we need many more uh, photos of them to properly identify them. So we need a face left, a face right, a body left, a body right, and their belly. We can also identify them through their pelage, which is markings. And so far we have identified all of these individuals. So there, there are over 200 individuals identified and there are still more. So this is a, uh, so we're wondering how long has OFA been here? So the first set of observations relate to a trip on the 7th of October, 2012. And so through markings, uh, we found that this is OFA, this record from 2012, because OFA has a V-shaped scar on the side of her mouth. And she also has two lateral marks on her back, which we don't know what they're caused by, but we're presuming propeller marks. And so we can see this is, we can see the same scars uh, showing seven years later. The, before OFA, the longest recorded residency was in four months, and it was in Georgia, outside the Antarctic. So she has been here for seven years and counting. She is still in New Zealand today. And so this leads us to our next uh, form of residency is births. So we thought that there have been no births uh, outside the Antarctic, but actually that is false because we saw a birth, but that went unpublished. And so we can see multiple births happening. And I think there are as of now five pubs, don't quote me on that, but. Which leads us into our next point, their conservation status, because they are of, they're a very important species. And so we can classify them as resident now because we can see that they do not match the vagrant profile. And so uh, the Department of Conservation classified uh, OFA and all of her leopard seal companions uh, as resident in 2019, which was a great accomplishment because it showed that our research effort efforts weren't in vain, which leads us into our next step for research on this resident population. So we want to know their occurrence and their movement. So are sightings increasing? How far do they travel? And where, where are they? And also we want to know what are the seals eating while they're here? We can, uh, so 
leopard seals in New, in New Zealand. We're not sure what they're eating exactly, but we know in the Antarctic they feed on penguins and other uh, marine mammals, and they also have specialized teeth that are uh, made to filter and krill. That's why you can see the ridges on her teeth. That is what they're for. So, so far we have identified a few prey items from scat analysis. So feathers, bones, scales, fur, animal remains, and other things. And this is just a fun anecdote, but leopard seal poops out a USB drive. Uh, so it went through her digestive tract and we found it when we were collecting a scat sample two years later. So crazy. It's, it's, it's honestly very remarkable. And also, because unfortunately we do find quite a few deceased leopard seals, uh, we have started to build a necropsy database, which we can find more about the health of the population thanks to the Otago Museum. And this is a seal getting an MRI, the pup. But there are also many threats that, that the leopard seal population of New Zealand are facing. And so there are natural injuries, but there are also human induced ones. And you can see very clearly the, the difference here. It's the human induced injuries look far more intentional. And here we can see a, uh, a leopard seal that died. And when looking at scanning for the autopsy, we found hundreds and hundreds of small bullets, small shotgun pellets. So there's no way that that is a natural uh, threat. And so Ofa was injured by a suspected firearm in 2019, so last year. And this led to a lot of questions about how we were going to help her uh, if we needed to capture her temporarily to check this out, but it actually ended up healing on its own, which was quite, quite remarkable. Uh, so we've been doing research on management, so how humans and leopard seals can coexist, because that is an important part of it. And so we have set up public guidelines uh, for encountering leopard seals. So many people, when they see a leopard seal, they think of a big, scary, menacing predator. So this image is from the movie Happy Feet, and we can see a leopard seal and the red eyes. It looks very threatening and the large teeth. But the reality of it is that leopard seals, they aren't trying to actively go out of their way to hurt people. Uh, they will not hurt people unless disturbed. They honestly just want to sleep. And uh, so these public guidelines are stay at least 20 meters away. Keep dogs away because but and also do not touch them. They will uh they will uh present very threatening behavior. Do not feed the leopard seals and just overall do not disturb them. And so we have set up a reporting hotline with leopardseals.org. And so we need the date, the times first and last seen, the location detailed so that we can possibly find them if there are people on close to or on site. And if SCAD is present and the approximate length of the leopard seal. So if, if you guys want to follow along with leopard seal daughter's research, here are our social medias. And uh, thank you for listening. So I have included my email and my Instagram if you would like to ask me questions or keep in touch with me. And thank you so much for listening. I'm gonna stop sharing. And... That was a very impressive presentation from London Fletcher. And it was about the first resident leopard seal population outside the Atlantic and how to connect with her. Uh, that was London Fletcher again, who has her own nonprofit Aquatic Research Conservancy. Thanks to our other two speakers today, Jeff Jacobson of BioWaves Inc. and Orca Network's Howard Garrett, who shared with us killer whale biology and gave us an update on two new J-Pod calves and the ensuing celebration and implications of that event. That concludes day one of the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium 
brought to you by Mindanomo Whale and Seal Study and KGUA Public Media in Walala, located at the junction of both Mendocino and Sonoma Coasts. We are simulcasting this Zoom symposium on our YouTube channel and sharing to our Facebook and Instagram pages. You can hear us online at kgua.org, through our Air Pocket app by Radio Rethink, or on apps Radio Garden and tune in. Stay tuned for the rest of the week for more of the 2020 Ocean Life Symposium on Peggy's Place. Here's a quick rundown before we go to the top of the hour. Tomorrow, Tuesday, October 27th, our speakers and topics include the Ocean Foundation's Richard Charter, who will give us an informative presentation on defending our planet and being one with nature during a time of broken promises. Ocean Conservation Research's Michael Stalker will present What Was That Sound? Acoustical Adaptations to the Ocean's Dark and Wet Environment. And University of New Hampshire's Carter Mercer, Scott's nephew, who will talk us, to us about the housing market response to sea level rise. On Wednesday, October 28th, it's the University of the Redlands, Tessa Foster, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy's Marianne Long, and Toyon Research Corporation's Christina Tombach Wright. They will talk about the effects of warming waters on marine mammals in the Southern California Bight, how awareness inspires conservation, and emerging technologies for marine mammal research. The last day of the symposium, Thursday, October 29th, it's the Noyo Center for Marine Sciences, Sarah Grimes, who will talk to us about what or who has washed ashore in 2020. Blue Planet Strategies, Zach Cliver will give us two presentations, one on the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale and another on the pursuit for ropeless fishing for lobster and crab. Wrapping up the week is a conversation with Scott and Tree, Mercer and KGUA's founder and general manager and host of Peggy's Place, Peggy Berryhill, who will review some of the things we've learned this week. A little more about Peggy is that she is a multi-award winning Native American a producer, radio producer, journalist, and was the first indigenous female journalist on national public radio. That's all right here from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Pacific, repeating every day, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. This entire week, we are simulcasting on KGUA in Walala 88.3 FM, which streams around the world at kgua.org and on our new YouTube TV channel, which would we did share on our Facebook and Instagram pages. If you'd like to catch this event at a future date, note that each day's event will be saved on the KGUA YouTube channel. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same place. That's it for Peggy's Place. I'm host and producer Leanne Lindsay, and it's time now for us to move on over to Native America Calling from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we are going to pull them up in just a moment right here at KGUA. It's 10 o'clock, and it is Monday, October the 26th, 2020. Thank you for listening. <laughs>